mysterious or miraculous. My friend was a new driver, so she was young. It was a hot day and we wanted an ice cream. So we thought, let's go for a drive. And she pulled out of a junction into a coat. And the coat, it hit the car and it actually killed her. I was 13 weeks in the coma. My mum and dad were told three times that I was dead. And if I ever woke up, I'd never walk or talk. Permanent vegetable. After the accident, I haven't got much memory at all, really. I just about remember waking up this morning. <laughs> 17 years of my life have completely gone. I know everything I did. I know the emotions I had. I know the thoughts, the feelings, everything that I had. I just can't remember actually doing it. They call it experiential memory problems. But I've got the memory of when I was in my coma, I met with God. God, he kind of stopped me and could see that I was savable and he said to me, I'm not ready for you yet, you are not dying because he had life plans for me. He didn't tell me what those plans were, but you know. Do you know what is weird? Before my accident, my faith had completely disappeared. I was a young, cool student. I feel like God has stripped me of all my memories because he wants me just to make new memories. He wants me to build a new life. So he's completely got rid of my old life because he says, you don't need to remember how you were because you're not like that anymore. I feel as well, God, he is wanting me to help promote road safety for young drivers. So what I do now, I work with the fire, the police, the ambulance, and we hold a day for young people about safe driving. We are the Safe Drive Stay Alive team. And what I have to do to a theatre full of young people, I have to give my accident story. I had 18 months of hospital and rehab. I met my husband at a, a local disabled dating group. We got the vicar who brought him to the Lord through the Alpha Course back to marry us. It was a really great day because I never thought it would happen. I feel like God had the purpose of my life into being a living testimony living demonstration of what work he can do. Death is supposed to be that definite moment when we pass over to the next life and be with God. But sometimes, as with the story we've just heard from one of our listeners, Christina, we can be called back to this realm. But what happens at that point of crossover? Are people that go to the brink of death and come back able to see something or bring back a message? That's our conversation on this episode of Mysterious or Miraculous. This is the show where we look at all things spiritual, supernatural, and maybe even a little spooky, and discuss how we, as Christians, might relate to these things unseen. I'm Lauren. 
And I'm Ewan, and as your host for this look at this mysterious topic, we're not here to tell you what to think or feel. What we want to do is make sure that every Christian has a strong biblical foundation when it comes to the supernatural. So today we're talking about near-death experiences. I don't know if there's really much reference to them in the Bible, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on biblical evidence for near-death experiences. It's interesting, is it? People who have a near-death experience, it seems to be that something is happening on the edge of life and death, and they're not actually completely dead, as it were, although that sounds a really odd thing to say, but yet they're not alive either it's right on the edge and that's what i think we're talking about with a near-death experience is saying people who have these experiences feel that they've had a glimpse of heaven or maybe even of hell but some kind of evidence of an afterlife an afterlife where in some way we are conscious we are aware and depending on the story we are in the presence of god or we're outside of the presence of god But of course, near-death experiences aren't just confined to Christians. Many people who aren't Christians feel they've had some sort of experience as well. One of the verses perhaps that is helpful to consider is when Jesus says to the thief on the cross, you know, the, the thief says, hey, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus promises him, today you'll be with me in paradise. And that's one of a number of clues, I think, in scripture that when we die, we don't go into a, a soul sleep or a, a state of non-existence, but that there is a paradise, a, a heaven, a place where our spirits, where our souls go to reside until Jesus comes back and we're resurrected. So if the Bible points to the evidence that there is a place that our spirits or souls go when we die, what is it for the person who's having a near-death experience that they maybe get a glimpse into that world or a glimpse into that kingdom. Have you had any uh, experience uh, or stories or or hear of people having this kind of... No, I mean, I've watched a lot on YouTube because there's a lot of them going on there. And I believe that people are encountering Jesus. We know lots of stories of people from different religions who have this amazing encounter with Jesus and then they become Christian because they're like, God revealed himself to me and he revealed himself to me as Jesus which is really exciting. But I guess the question of the skeptic would be, how do we know that it's an encounter rather than a dream? Was it just an impression? And I know God can talk to us through dreams, but how do we know that it's a real encounter? Yeah, and I think it's a great question and probably an unanswerable one, but the the burden of proof, I guess, is always on the person who's had the near-death experience. Mm -hmm. And ultimately... We have to say, amazing as some of these stories are and amazing as some of these experiences are, they're hard to prove, if not impossible to prove, for the very reason that we're talking about something outside of our own physical realm. We're talking about our soul leaving our body and entering some other space or dimension. And then, as you say, for many people, encountering Jesus or encountering God or being reunited with their loved ones I know of someone who whose son was dying or had died and had seen the classic thing, a, a bright light, a tunnel, and a deep sense of peace and had gone towards that light and then had returned to his body and is, is still alive today. And now he's not a Christian, but for him, there was absolutely a, a sense of being convinced there is something out there and it's peace and it's good. And I would love to know for him that that it would lead him to Christ, that now being convinced that there is something more out there after death, that it would lead us to seek, okay, well, if there's this good place, how do I get there? You know, Jesus, Jesus says, well, the only way to the Father is through me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And for some people, they can have this near-death experience. It could be really quite profound and peaceful and, and life-changing, clearly. But the burden of proof is on them that it actually happened. And that's very hard to prove. And my prayer, I guess, is that for people who've had that experience, that it would lead them to know Jesus. There are some stories that are quite provable. There, There's not many of them, <laughs> but there are some uh, that tend to be 
an example of someone having left their body or being on their deathbed and being aware of something happening in a different part, a different location or a different space. So uh, one example is of a guy who had died. By all accounts, his body had died. At least there was no brain function. And he saw on the other side of his campus, two cars crash. He returned to his body and he was able to say, I witnessed a car crash and that crash had happened. Wow. That sounds totally amazing, right? And, I, and I'll be honest, I don't know what the spiritual significance of that is other than it's really amazing. But that's yeah, one yeah. of the few um, kinds of stories that are verifiable because with near-death experiences, it's very hard for, for people to say, was this a vision or was this a dream? Was this my brain cells all sparking off at one time in the last seconds yeah. of my life? You're reminding me as well of stories where people are like, I watched my body and I watched the surgeons do this and do this, and that could then be confirmed that, yes, they did do those things, which you wouldn't have known about. And so that's something else that kind of could be proven. One of the other things I, I find kind of interesting about this topic is these experiences do tend to have very similar characteristics. You know, there's often the yeah. bright light at the end of the tunnel or you're feeling peaceful, you're being reunited with a loved one, you're having an out-of-body experience, you're encountering God or a higher being or whatever. But it makes me think something similar to, you know, Paul's conversion in Acts. He had the bright light. He had this encounter with God. Would you say that was a near-death experience or was it just simply wow. his encounter with God? I don't know. Yeah, that's a great question. So this is Paul encountering the risen Jesus in a unique way, isn't it? Everyone who has met the resurrected Jesus has done so before Jesus ascended to heaven. So they've met the, the, the physically resurrected embodied Jesus. And yet Paul has this experience that is profound. He describes it as he, he didn't even really deserve to have it. It was such a special occurrence. I, I think I would struggle to describe that as a near death experience because well, for one thing, he didn't die, I guess <laughs> it's, it's true to say, but that those around him also recognized something was happening. They, they couldn't hear the voice of, of Jesus, but they recognized that something supernatural and, and odd was happening. And then, of course, Paul or Saul as he was, was, was blinded. And so what I think he had was a glorious encounter with the risen Christ, but I don't think it counts as a near death experience. I get what you're asking because it's, it's the nearest kind of thing we can picture, isn't it, to, to having some sort of heavenly vision or supernatural experience that affects our whole body. Paul has had this vision of Jesus, and that was a powerful experience that obviously resulted in Paul's conversion. And I think the, the point of that partly is that people were left in no detail. Paul really had encountered Jesus, and he really had changed from this man who was persecuting the church and killing Christians to one who is now preaching Christ. But he does have an experience that he describes in 2 Corinthians 12 that, again, while not a near-death experience, might come closer to us thinking about as an out-of-body experience. The context for it is that he's being accused, basically, of being a bit of a loser, a not very impressive apostle, and there's all these more impressive <laughs> preachers and speakers and miracle workers, and they're trying to do Paul down. And so he says, okay, well, look, I'm not one for boasting, but if I must boast, let me tell you something quite amazing. I must go on boasting. There is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ. I think he's talking about himself. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. So if the first heaven is like our skies and, and if the second heaven is like the kind of the wider universe and space, then he says, I've been caught up to this third heaven the, the spiritual realm where God is, whether in the body or out of the body, I'm not really sure, but God knows. And because I think he's talking about himself, he says, I, I heard things that can't be told, which man may not utter. But on behalf of this man, I will boast. And so I think we get a, a, a moment in scripture there where Paul's saying, I don't quite know, God knows, but I might have had an out of body experience. But either way, somehow I ended up in the third heaven, in the presence of God, where he is. And so we might say, well, surely, Paul, that was definitely out of body experience because your body couldn't go there. I think that might be the closest 
we get to, again, it's not exactly this, is it? But it might be the closest we get to a near-death experience being described in the Bible. Maybe if we take a look at what pop culture has brought to us about near-death experiences and what we have been taught as people about what they are. I know that the term was coined more in the 1970s, but we know yeah. that it's been studied for hundreds of years. So what have we learned from history about these experiences? And then what have we learned from popular culture? Yeah. Again, so yeah, around the sort of mid seventies, a guy called Raymond Moody, he was the guy that kind of coined this phrase that we talk about now, near death experiences. And historically, I guess there's always been a fascination. What, what happens to me after I die here in the West, our prevailing culture for the last 1500 more years has been, well, the Bible tells us what happens after we die, we go to heaven and we live with Jesus. And so there's already culturally, historically within our context and understanding a belief in the afterlife. Of course, not everyone believes in that, but that's a commonly held idea and it comes from the Christian principles. But of course, you could go back to many other pre-Christian religions and faiths as well and see that there's clearly a belief in the afterlife. And so it's not a surprise to us in a way that historically people want to believe when my physical body dies my soul will carry on living. And so I think equally, it's no surprise that people will say, I came so close to death, my body stopped, but I had this vision or experience of what comes after. And somehow I've been allowed to continue living and I, and I can share a bit of what happens. So for instance, one famous story in, in the Western culture is of, of this guy, Colton Burpo. If you've ever seen the book heaven is for real or if you've seen the film because that was actually made into a hollywood film colton when he was uh, a young boy died as good as and had some vision of heaven he believes he went to heaven that he met family members that he met jesus and then he came back and told his parents about it and he knew things about a relative who he claims to have met in heaven that he couldn't possibly have known about that relative and so with his dad he, he wrote this book describing his experience and you can find lots of things around about Colton Burpo he still tours really talking about those experiences I'm a natural skeptic and so I want to be sure again I, I want to say that you know the burden of proof is always on people who make the claims and unfortunately there's been so many people who have claimed to have these kind of experiences who then turn out basically to have not have. We want the comfort of knowing, don't we? That what we believe about life after death is true. That when I die, I really will go and be with Jesus and it really will be okay. And I really will be united with those family members who died in Christ. And I, I want to be very gracious in the way I say it, but I think we need to be careful about seeking that kind of affirmation. Because again, I think it's right there in God's word and there's enough in God's word that promises me that I'm secure in him and my spiritual eternal life is secure in him, that I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, that I belong to him, that I will be with Jesus in paradise. I don't want to rush to look to humans for that affirmation. I want to look to God's word and to Jesus himself. So that's not me discrediting Colton Burpo's story, but it's me saying as Christians, amazing as stories like that are, I don't know that we need to push too far to pursue them for a sense of comfort or a sense of certainty. I was just reminded of Ephesians 2 verse 6 and it says that God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms, heavenly places. And so there's this idea that we are seated in heaven right now, even right. though we're here on the earth. And so we don't need to have a near-death experience to experience heaven because we can in some way tap into the reality of where we are in heaven and experience heaven right now. We see in the book of Revelation, John had this incredible vision of heaven, you know, in Isaiah 6. Isaiah has a vision of heaven, 
So I believe it's possible for us to know where we're going and to see what it's going to be like through the power of God and through God talking to us here and now mm. that we don't need to seek it out. Or I, I don't think anyone's actively seeking out a near-death experience in that they're <laughs> trying to die to have one. Yes. But I think that there is a reality that we can tap into something of heaven now if we ask and if we seek God on it. Yeah, it's 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 exactly right. We're seated with Christ on high now. And that's because this whole process of, of coming to faith in Jesus is that you're united with him, you're united with him in his death, Paul says, and in his burial, and you've been raised with him in baptism to new life. And so you are, we are in every way connected with Christ. It's hard for us to get our heads around what the reality of this is actually like, but we are, the Bible assures us, seated with Christ now. You mentioned John and his vision of heaven on Patmos that we read about in Revelation and Isaiah and Isaiah 6 and his vision of heaven. And Ezekiel has a vision, an amazing heavenly vision as well. But they're very clear to describe that's exactly what they are, visions. I think that's different again from what Paul said about him being transported yeah. to the throne room. I think, you know, there's a distinction to be made there as well between being transported somewhere and having been given a, a, a vision of, of something, it doesn't quite come close to the idea that they went to those places. And certainly, as you say, for John, not at a moment of death. More, I think, that those people who have this vision of heaven in Scripture and a vision of the throne room, people like Isaiah and Ezekiel and John, that it is a moment of appointing, of ordaining them to their prophetic ministry. It tends to be that the prophets, especially the Old Testament prophets, had an encounter with God that, in a sense, qualifies them to do their prophetic work. In terms of culture, you asked, do you know the film It's a Wonderful Life? Have you seen that? I've not seen it, no. Oh. I'm not a very good movie person to talk to. <laughs> there we go. It's a world away from The Exorcist, I assure you, but it's probably, it's probably my favourite film. And it, it is a great example. It's a film about a guy who has these ambitions in life and every step of the way he sacrifices his ambitions so that someone else in his life can get their step up or get their moment. And he reaches a point where he's really quite desperate in life and he's considering, in fact, he does uh, attempt to take his own life. And at that moment, God sends an angel and this angel rescues him from the river he's jumped into and he, he says it would be basically he says it would be better that i had never been born you know everyone would be happier if i had never been alive and so the angel then his tactic is to give this guy george bailey this experience of what would be different in the lives of the people around him had he never existed and I... so george bailey in the last quarter of the film gets this vision of, of really how sad people's lives would be without him what an impact he had on them because of his sacrificial nature and his kindness and his joy. And so that kind of convinces him, yes, life is good. <laughs> and he has the second chance at life. If you haven't seen it, Lauren, you've got to see it this Christmas, but that's, that's the time to watch it. But, but the, the joy in the film is at the moment between his life and his death, he has this revelation, not of heaven, but of the value of life and the impact that we make on others. And so then when he comes back, he has a fundamentally like altered perspective on the value of life and the things that he truly appreciates, the things that frustrated him before, you know, he now loves. Maybe in that sense, when we're thinking about near death experiences as Christians, because the burden of proof is on the person who's had this experience, maybe the best we can hope is that God would use those experiences, whether they were real and literal or whether they were experienced in some other way, that God would use those experiences for his glory, for grace, that we would learn to value the life that God's given us here on this earth and value the people around and make the most of our life. I think God can use those stories and we know whether it's in the Bible or it's not, God's still able to use it for his glory um, and to bring people into his kingdom. And so that's what's really exciting about near-death experiences is when it brings people into the kingdom of God, um, when it brings lives back to God, because it might be for that individual, yeah. but it's also for that individual to share their story and to change many other lives as a result. Yeah, I know people who have had profound experiences when they've been close to death. 
but I want us to, to ask, I guess, where's the evidence in scripture that this is something that might happen or what's it going to show us? We're, we're people with souls, with psyches that, that can exist beyond death. And for many people, as Christians, we take that for granted, but for many people, even that's kind of a step too far of a claim, isn't it? Yeah. That, that even our consciousness is something that, although we perceive it to be something separate from our bodies, our consciousness is actually just something very clever and interesting that our brains are doing and that the soul in that sense is an illusion. It's really hard for us to, as conscious beings, to describe what it is about us that makes us feel we have a soul. But the Bible assures us that our soul is a real thing and that when we die, our soul goes to be with Jesus. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, so we're always of good courage in our ministry. We know that while we're at home in the body here, it's a bit like we're away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we're of good courage, and we'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And that's mm -hmm. Paul's kind of picture is that while I'm here ministering on earth and it's hard work in this tent that I'm in, my home is my body and I'm not at home with the Lord as such. But there'll be a day when my body is gone. I'm no longer at home in my body, but I'm at home with the Lord. And Paul seems to think then at, at this moment, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil, whether we're away or at home, we make it our aim to please him. So Paul seems to be saying, there will come a time when my soul leaves my body and I will go and be with the Lord. And that's far better. To the Philippians, he says, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would love at this point, Paul's in prison right into the Philippians. He's like, I would love at this point just to go <laughs> to die and be with the Lord. But I've got a feeling that's not his plan for me yet, because I think he wants me to come back to you guys and, and encourage you. But that attitude that he has of, if I die today, that's gain, because I'm confident that I will go and be with the Lord. Yeah, and the joy that... We don't die, as it were, because Jesus, through his death and resurrection, that we will live an eternal life with him. Yeah. And that's the glorious story that we get to be a part of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Near-death experiences are often seen by people as a trigger for a second chance and a change of life. But I guess maybe we can change our lives now. We don't need to have a near-death experience to want to change our lives. Yeah, I was thinking as you said that, in a sense, we've had not a near-death experience, but a genuine death experience Amen. when we've yes. come to Christ, right? That we have died to our old self and our old ways. And that, uh, as I said earlier, where, where Paul writes, you know, we have died with Christ and been buried with him and risen to him. In that yeah. sense, we've not had only a, a near-death experience, but we've had a... A, a death and resurrection experience. That's so um, good, yeah. The idea that we might seek some comfort or, or confidence that there is life after death, we have that from Scripture. And so it is right to think, like you say, about looking to change our lives now, making the most of this life now. We only have one life in this body. There will come a time when we're resurrected, but this is our life. It does make me think then where Jesus says, look, if you want to save your life, you will lose it. But for those who are prepared to lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel in, in this time, will save it. In other words, Jesus says, you have got this one life. How are you going to spend it? Are you going to spend it trying to save yourself and pursue your comforts and your desires and, and all those things that are offered there? Or are you going to take up your cross, follow me, die to yourself? Because you are stone cold guaranteed that you are sealed for eternity by my spirit. So are you prepared to lose this life for my sake? Maybe not literally, although we know that even around the world today, there are martyrs, people who are dying for the name of Christ and for the yeah. sake of following him. But Jesus says, you know, are you prepared to lose everything you value in this life for the privilege and the joy of being able to follow me? And so it's a challenge for us as Christians then. Can we change our lives now? Are you waiting for some miraculous intervention or some kind of proof or evidence of what things are going to be like after death before you fully commit your ways to Jesus now? Or will you believe what the Bible has said? Will you believe what Jesus has already shown and, and follow his call to say, well, I'm going to take 
the narrow way. I'm going to enter through the narrow gate. Even if it's a hard road, I'm going to take up my cross, be prepared to sacrifice myself in this life, as it were, in order to know the blessings and, and benefits of, of living for Jesus. I don't think we need these near-death experiences and assurances of what's to come in order to follow Jesus' example today. So, yeah, maybe that's wow. the place for us to end on this one, Lauren. <laughs> yeah, well, it's such an interesting topic. And, you know, this idea of where we go when we die and uh, people are desperate to know. But the joy that we have in salvation is that we know where we go when we die yeah. and that we get to have this heavenly forever encounter where we're living with Jesus and that we can change our lives now we can live the way that we want to live now. We don't need to wait for a moment, but we can change now and we will live with Jesus forever. And that's the exciting part of being a Christian. While only a few may be called to have a sneak peek in a near-death experience, God promises to change our lives in the here and now. So look for the moments that the Lord can work in you today. And don't be afraid. You've been listening to Mysterious or Miraculous from UCB. If you're interested in knowing more, there'll be Bible and research links in the show notes, and we will be back next week looking at the topic of resurrection. Mysterious or Miraculous from UCB.